the CTSNet Roundtable. Today we have a very fascinating, interesting, and topical discussion on education in cardiothoracic surgery, specifically curriculum design. What are we doing to keep our graduates relevant? Today we have five leaders in cardiothoracic surgery uh, that run the gamut of, ex of experience service line leaders to a, a chief resident. And we're gonna to talk today about what our residents need to learn to stay relevant within our fourth industrial age of knowledge and technology. Um, what we'll start with is introducing ourselves and talking about what we do in education. I'm Dr. David Cook. I'm head of general thoracic surgery at UC Davis Health. And I'm our program director for our cardiothoracic surgery residency. Hi, uh, Rishi Reddy, uh, general thoracic surgeon at the University of Michigan. Uh, I'm the clerkship director uh, for all of surgery, uh, as well as have an assistant program director role, and also help coordinate our robotic uh, curriculum for our residents. I'm Amy Fiedler. I'm an adult cardiac surgeon at the University of Wisconsin. I'm one of our associate program directors for our cardiothoracic surgery residency program, as well as the clerkship director for the cardiac surgery rotation for our medical students. I'm Luis Godoy. I'm the Administrative Chief Resident uh, in our integrated program at UC Davis. And currently for education, I help develop and coordinate our core curriculum for our um, uh, junior residents. And I'm Tom Verghese. I'm the head of sec uh, the section of thoracic surgery at the University of Utah, also the program director of the cardiothoracic surgery fellowship there, as well as hold some leadership positions at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. Great. So I think we'll start off with uh, uh, Rishi. What are the pressing fundamental skill sets that residents will need to keep pace? So that's a great question, uh, Dave. I think that um, residents are going to have to keep pace with a lot of the different uh, platforms that are coming out um, in, in terms of operations. I think historically we have taught people how to operate in a large open operations. Um, residents have learned how to do minimally invasive surgery over the last few years, but I think now we're going to have to teach them how to be competent in the robotics platform, for example. I think on the cardiac side, you can see from the minimally invasive and, and learning wire skills. So I, I think we're going to have to learn a lot of new modalities. I think even advanced endoscopy is going to become a critical skill going forward. And uh, Amy, from the cardiac perspective, uh, there are a lot, a lot of new clinical trials looking at structural heart. Uh, and other uh, modalities, what do you think our residents need to learn now? So I couldn't agree with Rishi more in the sense that a lot of technology is coming down the pipeline and our residents are going to need to be well versed in that in their training when they graduate to practice. With respect to cardiac, certainly the structural heart programs are really up and coming. And so developing rotations for our trainees, specifically within the structural heart team, advanced echocardiography, wire skills with respect to TVAR, and even transeptal approaches to some of the more complicated valvular pathologies is certainly prudent. Luis, you're on the, the cusp of graduation, and this will all be yours someday. So <laughs> what are you looking at knowing that I, I need to learn this? Well, over the course of the six years of my training program thus far, I've seen an evolution um, even within this short period of time in both cardiac and general thoracic surgery uh, with some of the main interests coming up with like the, the students that are rotating through for uh, uh, rotations and uh, applicants for our residency program. Um, uh, there's a lot of interest in minimally invasive approaches in both uh, cardiac surgery and general thoracic surgery. Uh, and I think over the past two to three years, I've seen a large movement, not only in our program, but in other programs around the country, um, tailoring their, uh, their educational pathways uh, in that direction. And Tom, you lead a, a comprehensive cancer center. So yeah. what, what's new that you I, I, I think that... Um, we realize that in all of cardiothoracic surgery and all of its subspecialties, there's a lot of change happening around us. And I think that part of this is ensuring that we uh, impart skills to those trainees, the ability to recognize change, how to incorporate changes to their clinical practice, uh, work in teams. These so-called so soft skills, I believe, are going to be even more critically important in the time ahead. And, uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, you know, many of the skills that Luis is learning right now, he may still be doing years from now. Who knows? There may be technology coming down the pipeline that's going to completely change the way we deliver care. But we need to make sure that we have an organized framework to be able to assess to see if those are better skills and then be able to incorporate those in our practice. 
And one important thing about residency training and cardiothoracic surgery is that our leadership tends to be forward thinking and, and anticipate what's on the horizon. Let's talk about current curriculum at each of your sites. Uh, Tom, what, what are you guys doing? So one of the novel things that we did is, is that um, if you think about what's the ultimate goal, you start with why. We know that we are training the leaders of tomorrow. Surgeons are leaders. And so if that's the why we're doing this, and then what we're supposed to accomplish is we want to develop truly competent, independent individuals, the, the, uh, the how, how we reach there is really talk, is what curriculum means. The novel thing that we're doing at our program is, is that we're really focused on feedback. You know, I, the best example I tell people about feedback is if you think about every day that you go to work, and if you go through a school speed zone, there's a speed limit that's posted, there's a radar right underneath which tells you exactly what you're doing, and it gives you the opportunity, whether if you're going above the speed limit, to correct that so that you can achieve that. And you, plus you know that what the consequence is. If you're caught speeding, you're gonna get, get a traffic ticket. That's exactly the framework that we wanted to do. And so the uh, curriculum we rolled out is really assessing decision making. So for those trainees that are going to the operating room, we tried a bunch of apps and we realized that the best format was actually just email. So the night before, there's a formal email that goes out to the attending of the record that says that, uh, and we really talk about two, uh, three things. That is indications for the procedure, what type of pitfalls that they can anticipate, and then what are their learning objectives. And we want the learner to kind of declare to the attending, this is what my assessment is. We want the written record so that the attendings who are used to responding in emails in real time can then correct, or if everything, all three parts of the plan are correct, no problem, they say, great plan, and they go forward with that. We do that the night before, they do the case, they have a discussion, and then afterwards, a summary email, just, just added on a couple sentence, is sent back to the attending saying that, did they achieve all those objectives they wish to achieve, or you know, I stumbled on this case, and then it gives the faculty the opportunity to send that back. All of those emails are cc to me as the program director, and it gives me an opportunity also to make sure that it, the timely performance is okay, but I can also then give feedback to the faculty members if they're doing a good job communicating or not. We've rolled this out for the last couple of years. It's a work in progress, but our hope is, is that hopefully as we perfect this, that we'll have this model that we can then share, share with other training programs as well. And so the goal is really looking at the decision making going into the operating room. Decision making is extremely key and uh, oftentimes it's called a soft skill. Um, but what about some of the, sh the hard skills, especially in cardiac surgery, Amy? Sure, so at the University of Wisconsin, we've actually developed a very robust simulation curriculum for our cardiothoracic trainees. And while simulation isn't entirely new, I think the program that we've developed is quite innovative. And the program begins when the trainees set foot at our institution as a first year cardiothoracic resident. And what it entails is initially learning the fundamentals of cardiopulmonary bypass through a week long boot camp, similar to what the uh, TSRA, TSDA has available. And in doing that, when they exit that boot camp, they've got a leg up on what's gonna, what it's going to look like in the operating room. And so what we found is that our trainees, specifically for cardiac, arrive in the operating room at the beginning of their training, much more prepared as a result of that simulation boot camp. We continue to allow them to simulate different cardiac scenarios with the Kind Heart Simulator once a month throughout their time with us which means that they now were a three-year program, so every month for three years, they're doing dedicated simulation with the cardiac attending. And I think that helps improve their operative skills because cardiac is so technically challenging. And it also builds relationships amongst the trainees as well as the faculty members. Another, right. <laughs> another thing that we've done at the University of Wisconsin, specifically with some of the more uh, innovative or or um, more difficult to teach skills such as advanced echo, transeptal techniques, et cetera, is setting up dedicated rotations within the cardiology department for our trainees. So now each trainee spends a dedicated month of time focused on structural heart, as well as a dedicated month of time focused on complex coronary interventions, as well as echocardiography. So I think what we're doing is we're innovating to to give the trainees um, 
optimal simulation, as well as exposure to a lot of the innovation within the field of cardiac surgery. So when they graduate, they feel comfortable with these different techniques and going into practice. Great, great. Well, let's stay in the Big Ten and what's <laughs> Michigan doing? So I think we're doing similar uh, endeavors is, is what's been commented on. Um, one thing that we have uh, really worked on uh, over the last couple of years, especially within the general thoracic side, has been our robotics curriculum. Um, and uh, we have shared that with a number of different institutions around the country. Um, I, I think the thing about that curriculum has been, um, we haven't so much focused on how to do a robotic lobectomy as much as how to use, how to learn robotic techniques. Um, we're still teaching a lobectomy, whether it's an open lobectomy, a VATS lobectomy, the, uh, you know, the inside portions, the anatomy are all the same. So it's really about how to use the robot safely. The other thing that I think we've done well is we've created guidelines that helps our faculty know, you know, which parts of the, the case to make sure the residents are doing. So we uh, have graduated um, expectations and graduated um, opportunities for the residents as they master skills to be able to do more, for, for example, of a lobectomy or a um, foregut operation. I think that's especially important for the new training paradigm, such as the Innovative Six Year Program, as well as the Four Three Program, where you're getting um, younger and younger trainees uh, uh, who are directly out of medical school or um, uh, not that far from medical school. Um, which leads us to Luis, who's a uh, I six resident at UC Davis. Tell us about some of the curriculum that you have found uh, uh, successful. Yeah, so at our institution at um, UC Davis in Sacramento, we, you know, I'd have to echo a lot of what's been said already. Um, primarily, our curriculum has evolved over the course of the past several years due to feedback provided by our residents uh, along the way, um, interest um, and special niches that people want to focus on. For example, most recently, we've started rotations with interventional cardiology at the request of residents who wanted to focus in that particular area, as well as uh, TAVR, um, uh, the TAVA curriculum that we have developed. <clears throat> uh, in addition, on the general thoracic surgery uh, aspect as well, we've also implemented a uh, graduated uh, robotics curriculum, uh, whereas um, Dr. Cook and Dr. Reddy already mentioned, uh, are structured in the sense of where, where the student and the resident as a learner is getting gradual, graduated responsibility in the cases. For example, in our lobectomy cases, oftentimes we start with uh, dividing the pulmonary ligament, the inferior pulmonary ligament, or dissecting out the mediastinal lymph nodes before we move on to dissecting around a, a pulmonary vein or an artery, because those are, um, as we know, higher stakes approaches, um, uh, especially for a learner. Um, but if I had to summarize one thing, is that the evolution of our program definitely goes back, you know, to complete circle to um, the feedback and the receptivity by our institution to allow us to tailor our curriculum. So, um, um, you know, trying to anticipate what's coming down the road uh, can be very difficult. Um, um, one thing I would like to ask is, what would you dream of, the, of a new curriculum to help adapt? For instance, um, uh, one opportunity is the use of portable ultrasound to replace a stethoscope, especially in the, in the setting of the I-6 program where you can start a trainee um, from medical school and over a six-year program, uh, perhaps using the new portable ultrasound devices that connect your iPhone and smart tab to replace the stethoscope. So as you're rounding in the ICU or the floor, you could actually look to see um, the IVC and look at volume. You could look at the heartbeat. You could look at the pleural space move and look for pleural fusions. Um, if you had unlimited funds or uh, <laughs> unlimited resources, which we all have in our residency programs, um, what new curriculum would you experiment with, uh, Amy? Oh, that's a tough question because we're old fashioned as cardiac surgeons. Um, I have never even heard of using the ultrasound for in the smart connectivity the way that you described. So I think that would be a, a cool use of technology. I'd like to focus a little bit more upon um, uh, creating curriculum that's going to, as some of us have talked about, the non-technical skills associated 
uh, with cardiothoracic surgery, which are so important. So I would think about the curriculum from the ground up, specifically when we're talking about I-6 trainees, who, as you allude to, are younger and coming right from medical school, and the development of the leadership skills necessary for them to be successful as a functioning cardiothoracic surgeon, and then creating a person, a graduate, who comes out of the training program, who is an exceptional leader, who has the ability to manage their finances when they go from being a trainee and maybe not making a bunch of money to taking their first attending job, having some of these life skills that are going to serve them well, not just as a surgeon, but as a good overall human being, too. I would like to focus the curriculum a bit more on those things. And, and that's key, because at the end of the day, we are graduating individuals who are caring for our communities uh, caring for our own families and our friends, and they need to be uh, really incorporated within the community and have all those skills. So to close uh, this wonderful t round table, uh, maybe we can have some uh, uh, final thoughts. Uh, Tom? Um, I think that it's extending on uh, what Dr. Fiedler has said as well. I, I would love to be able to see more work in uh, a competency-based curriculum. I think what both uh, 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 Rishi said and uh, Luis mentioned is about if you take robot skills, you know, at the end of the day, you want an independent, competent surgeon who ha is going to be entrusted with doing the, the entire procedure of performing a robot lung resection, for example. But then you break it down into all the different milestones that they have to meet to be able to achieve that. I'd love for us uh, as a specialty to really start doing more work on that because if we get rid of the word that drives me insane, the hidden curriculum, and just put everything out there transparent so that we clearly define these are the skills and every single aspect, leadership, all these things that you hope to achieve, that's the professional activity that we want you to achieve. What are all the different milestones to reach that? And I'm hoping in the years ahead that we start seeing some very uh, innovative design on establishing that type of curriculum. Perfect. Louise, final thoughts? Um, one thing is, I, I, as a trainee, I'd want to focus, or I would like our specialty to focus more on um, simulation-based training early on, especially, um, and uh, maybe some uh, augmented virtual reality uh, type of training as well. I think there's a lot that we can learn from from seeing uh, an operation from the surgeon's perspective. So utilizing technology you know, with cameras in, in that sense, uh, I think would be um, helpful. Great, Amy? Uh, so I think these are all phenomenal points. I would, I would say that we as a specialty, we're a great specialty, we're forward thinking and we're innovative. And I think that we just need to continue to listen to all of the stakeholders, the residents, the medical students, the attendings, and even the operating room staff and the nurses to understand where we may be deficient and, and incorporate all of the ideas of all of the stakeholders in order to develop a curriculum that suits the next generation of trainees. Great, Rishi. Um, I agree with all the great points made. Um, I just think we have to also remember to focus on treating uh, cardiothoracic diseases and that we are the, the optimal group to treat cardiothoracic diseases. A lot of these technical curriculums that we've talked about are really about um, technical skills management, but not necessarily about making someone an, uh, an expert in terms of um, just because you're a good robotic surgeon doesn't mean you're going to be a, a good person who can take care of um, you know, lung cancer. So just to reiterate, and we really need to make sure our learners are learning how to take care of cardiac disease, thoracic disease, um, and, and encourage that. Great, great. And also uh, another stakeholder that is uh, key and invaluable are our patients and uh, getting feedback from our patients who can evaluate our trainees and uh, provide that information uh, back to our supervisors and program directors and back to our trainees. So this is a, a wonderful uh, round tape. I want to thank all of you for providing all your expert insights. This is just an example of our house of cardiothoracic surgery uh, and its specialty is dedicated to training and innovating our curriculum to provide our trainees to be the best graduates that they can be and really serve our communities well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.